So like, you know, basically 75% of the world is over fat. Uh, 92% of Americans are over fat. And, and I'm going to um, stop you. I'm going to stop you right there because I bet you. So we talk about them, 70% of them being over fat. I, I, we would also say then 70% would be under muscled. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so like I, I do have patients who. Um, quality be- of muscle. Quality of muscle. Yeah, I have some patients who, because they weigh so much, they do have an okay amount of muscle if they weighed way less. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, but I absolutely agree. There's a, I, I have an avalanche of patients with um, normal weight obesity or sarcopenic obesity. Now, this is the worst thing ever. It's someone who's so sedentary and just sits on the couch and has no muscle at all. And so even though they look hugely fat, they actually don't weigh that much. <laughs> Thank you to Vivo Health for sponsoring this episode of the show. I am bringing to you my favorite Vivo barefoot shoe. It is what I've been using for the last year to train in. And I'm going to tell you what, Vivo Barefoot is on a mission to create regenerative footwear. Why do I love Vivo Barefoot? It allows me to lift in a way where I feel the ground. I never have to worry about if my shoe is going to be unsteady. I'm able to get in a good squat position. I'm able to do a good deadlift. I'm able to train closer to what I would do if I was, in fact, barefoot. And studies show that foot strength increases by 60% in a matter of months just by walking around in these Vivo barefoot shoes. I love these shoes. They have a range of shoes for kids, adults, walking, hiking, training, everyday wear you will not be disappointed. And in fact, go to vivobarefoot.com slash a Dr. Lion, and they're offering a 100-day trial on their footwear. That's vivobarefoot.com slash a Dr. Lion, and you can use the code Dr. Lion 15 for a discount on their footwear. Dr. Ted Naiman, He is a friend and truly, you know, you have innovated a lot of the protein discussion from a practical standpoint. And I consider you a great friend and an excellent physician and sounding board. So welcome back to the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. That was very complimentary. It's great to be here. I feel the same way about you. Um, Yeah, no, great. Thank you. Okay, ready for some rapid fire questions? And you and I are friends. So I am going, just so you all know, I will do um, Ted justice and I'm going to put him on the spot. Top three ways to lose body fat. You can only, you can only give me three. You got to give me your top three. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, <laughs> uh, let's see. I mean, obviously the big buckets in the uh, in the weight loss jar, our diet and exercise. But were you looking for something more specific than that? Uh, I'm exactly. assuming. Exactly. Okay. Um, protein, fiber, where does training fit in? And for those of you guys who don't know Ted, which everybody should know, Ted, um, he talks a lot about training and he talks a lot about protein and satiation, you name it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, well, protein would have to be on there for sure. So number one would be um, targeting protein, prioritizing protein, protein awareness. You want to uh, make sure you're eating adequate protein. You want to be eating that protein earlier in the day and earlier in the meal. And you're just trying to leverage it for uh, satiety and body composition and all the other great things that protein does for you. So number one would be protein prioritization. Number two would be uh, lowering the energy density of your carbs and your fats. So if you can keep the energy density of carbs and fats lower, you're going to automatically less calories. You're going to be avoiding some um, hedonic, hyperpalatable combinations of high energy density carbs and fats together that you can't say no to. Um, and then the third thing would be exercise. Basically, you are eating the calories of a moderately active version of yourself at all times. And if you're not at least moderately active, you're screwed. Like you'll be going nowhere. Uh, you can only get so far with diets. So you have to be having a little bit higher energy flux. And that's going to be some kind of exercise, probably more than 
most people trying to lose weight are already doing. So, so those are the, the big three. If you really just put a gun to my head and say, what are the three biggest things? It would be protein prioritization, lower energy density of non-protein macros, carbs, and fats, and then just <clears throat> upping the exercise in any way you enjoy. So it's sustainable. You know what I mean? I love that. I love that re reiteration, protein, lower energy density, and exercise. Protein recommendations. How do you recommend protein? How do you think about it? Right, right. So, uh, you know, we, we've we pretty much established that you don't need more than 1.6 kgs, uh, 1.6 grams per kg of um, ideal body weight or normal body weight or non-obese body weight uh, for maximum muscle protein synthesis. But I think going a little bit higher might give you satiety benefits that we haven't really explored as much as we should in the literature. So I kind of like a gram per pound of your ideal body weight for your reference body weight for your height. So not has nothing to do with how much you actually weigh. Um, you know, I have all these patients who they're like, yeah, I, you know, I should, I should be about 220 and I'm 250 now. And I'm like, I uh, know you should be like 150. <laughs> you know, it's just like right. way lower than everyone thinks. So you have to basically look at what your ideal, absolute ideal body weight would be for your height. And then a gram per pound of that, I think is a super awesome target. Um, most people, even if they're a little bit below that are going to be fine. So that's basically, um, my favorite metric is a gram per pound of ideal body weight based on your height, which might have nothing to do with how much you actually weigh. A wonderful recommendation. One gram per, per pound ideal body weight. As you'd mentioned, the evidence is really 1.6 grams per kg. However, when we're thinking about other things like satiation and, uh, perhaps protein turnover if someone was getting ill or increasing their training volume. I mean, there's many different reasons why one could choose protein over fats or carbs. When you think about protein, do you care about the source? Um, <clears throat> uh, less and less, to be honest, every day, because we have some really good uh, studies now on various types of soy protein and legume protein and other, you know, non-animal protein isolates. And they do seem to be okay if you up the quantity a little bit. Um, so you're basically getting uh, a, enough of all of the individual amino acids. So I'm not as worried about source. Um, I'm more worried about quantity. So just getting... Uh, uh, a total quantity high enough is more important to me than where it came from, because at the end of the day, it's just 20 amino acids um, broken down. So uh, the, I'm, I'm actually looking at the carbs and fats that come along with the protein more than I am where the protein actually came from, because there are some animal proteins that um, uh, just have horrible macros like hot dogs. You know, it's like, oh, OK, carnivores and instant win. Uh, maybe not since your hot dog has only 15% protein in it. And the ratio of fat grams to protein grams is horrific. And you'll probably not lose any weight doing that. So I'm not like, oh, it just has to be animal protein versus plant protein. Because there's some jacked vegan out there just consuming a bunch of soy isolates who's way more successful than someone who just hit the carnivore button and is just eating hot dogs. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm worried about the, the fat and carbs that come along with the protein. I'm worried about the, the total of the protein. I'm worried about the pro uh, the ratio of protein to non protein energy. But uh, at the end of the day, the protein is actually just 20 amino acids that breaks down immediately in your stomach anyway. So who cares um, actually where they're from? Although there is a little bit of a spectrum difference between plant proteins and animal proteins when it comes to some of the essential amino acids. So, you know, you have to take that into account, but as long as you up the quantity by, you know, maybe 20 or 30% of the most, you can get there with any source of protein. Um, and that is, uh, that is true. When we're talking about dietary protein, the evidence does suggest and point to that it is the total amount of protein and one could overcome the source if the protein is high enough. If you are hitting one gram per pound ideal body weight, does the source matter when it comes to the amino acids? The answer to that is actually no. Ted is, is correct on that. I will say that the lower your protein in your diet is, the more important it comes from animal-based sources. The other aspect to that is 
there, uh, dietary protein, yes, consists of 20 amino acids. I think, Ted, we are going to see the importance of the low molecular weight molecules like creatine and serine, taurine, and some of these um, components when we look at the food matrix. So from my perspective, adding in a mix of animal and plant-based proteins, it's probably going to be more effective for overall aging, you know, B12, zinc. Uh, curious as to what your thoughts are on that. And then I will also say, when you're younger, um, does the protein source matter as much? Not necessarily. Yeah, no, all great points. I totally agree with you. If you're if you're flying your protein plane really close to the ground and you're trying to live on your 48 grams per day, uh, it's a huge big deal um, if it's animal versus plant. Um, but if you're like some jacked vegan um, bodybuilder who's just consuming hundreds of grams of soy isolates every day, it, yeah, it doesn't really matter what the spread of the aminos are. So the, the less protein you're eating, the more critical it is that it's of the right spectrum of aminos. And then I totally also agree with the micronutrients uh, that come along with that protein. And I do think that probably omnivore is... Uh, you know, optimum. There's a reason why humans are <laughs> omnivores. And I do see patients who are strict religious vegans and they do have deficiencies in B12 and in zinc and in iron. And I see this all the time. I also have patients who are pure carnivore who have horrifically low um, folate levels and sometimes magnesium. And so uh, it, it does seem to be optimal to be uh, somewhere in between. This sort of like middle path might be the way to go on honestly a lot of this stuff. So yeah, good points. Um, yeah, definitely the combination of both plant and animal is ultimately where we're going. And Ted said something that changed my perspective th of thinking um, a while ago. I had always thought about the negative impact of processed foods. And we're going to move to kind of that highly palatable food discussion. But when you take a step back and you think about it, well, protein powders are highly processed. And, and definitely in the words in which we choose to speak about this probably makes a difference. So are all processed foods bad? No, because again, even the soy proteins, uh, that's a, it's a processed type food. Right. Yeah. And, and like, you know, from a first order heuristic, uh, okay, just eat whole unprocessed foods. Sounds really good. And that's kind of overarching, correct. Um, but then there are so many like whole unprocessed foods that if you just ate, the, you know, if I just ate dates and honey and tallow and lard and that's it, it would be probably not great. Um, so, but then if I'm eating my, you know, artificially sweetened Greek yogurt with amazing macros, I might have like, you know, huge success with that product. And so there's some, uh, there's, it's not a hundred percent. There are unprocessed foods that are not going to get you closer to your goals. And there are processed foods that will. And so I wish it was that easy, but it's not. And, and I hate to say it, but if you just look at the trend, um, humans are eating more and more processed foods. We will continue to eat more and more processed foods. We're not going to colonize Mars eating a whole unprocessed, you know, you're not just going to pull a turnip out of the ground and kill a animal with your bare hands when you're on the, you know, asteroid colony or whatever. So, so like going forward, it's just going to be more and more, more processed. So we really need to have a way to parse out which of these processed foods are good and bad. And uh, it's not going to be enough to just say unprocessed food because nobody will be able to afford that, or they won't be able to find it, or it's not going to be you know, it's just going to be less and less common, unfortunately, which is probably bad, but that's just the way it's going. It, and it is absolutely the way it's going. And it's, it is, and will be about finding solutions. You mentioned eating protein earlier on in the meal and also earlier on in the day. Why would one want to do that? Right, right. So <clears throat> protein is uh, incredibly satiating. It's the most satiating macronutrient. And it takes a while for that information to get to your brain. You know, it's going to be 20 minutes before your uh, aminos are hitting your bloodstream. And then you're getting some of this fullness from the, the lower portion of the small intestine and the and cretins and the GLP-1 and all of these other signaling hormones. It takes a while. It's kind of slow. And so if you can front load that protein, you're just going to eat less downstream calories. We have lots of studies on like preloads where you give someone a uh, a food, something to eat or drink, and then they hit the buffet an hour or two later, and we 
weigh and measure how much people eat. And proteins are really great preload, especially if it's before a meal. So we have studies where, like, for example, people drank a protein shake half an hour before their meal and they just eat, you know, 110 less calories. It's it's a it's a sort of a front loading thing for a satiety effect that takes a little bit of time to really maximize. So it's just really helpful to eat your protein first. Like, so that's, that's why dessert should be last. So if I just gave you like a whole box of Krispy Kreme to eat, you're going to eat the whole thing. And then I'm like, oh, and here's your 50 gram uh, protein shake. And you'll be like, okay. And you'll force that down. You know what I mean? So now you really haven't gone anywhere, even though you ate your 50 grams of protein with that meal. Uh, on the other hand, if you drink the 50 gram protein shake, you know, and then maybe 20, 30 minutes later, I give you the box of Krispy Kreme. You're going to eat like two and you're going to be done. And so it's just very valuable to front load that protein, not only um, per meal, but, you know, in your day. So we have studies on people who eat more protein earlier in the day and they're just more successful. They just eat less downstream calories later because they kind of got something they really need. And so that's why uh, protein prioritization, you know, or, uh, you know it's the, it should be the focus of every meal, every snack. Where's the protein? How much protein are you getting? Eating your protein first. Um, or something else first that has fiber or water in it. So drinking two glasses of water before you eat. Uh, this has been shown to ha um, people eat less calories. Eating a salad before you eat, you eat less calories. So you're front loading protein, fiber, and water, which are the main things that raise, you know, satiety per calorie. It's uh, giving you more weight and volume and nutrients for just less calories, basically. And that makes me, uh, and, you know, to just mention that is absolutely correct. And we see that in brain studies. There's been a lot of work. Heather Leidy really kicked this off when she imaged young women, whether they were skipping breakfast or having high protein meals, and then the later on downstream effects of their food choices. So if you are out there listening and you are thinking, I have my protein dialed in, another layer of strategy would be when you are sitting down to a meal, have your protein first, perhaps even have two glasses of water, then have your protein and see if that impacts the amount that you're consuming. Ted really believes in calorie control as well as, as I do. There's some camps that say calories don't matter. I am in the camp that I firmly believe the quality of the calories and the, the calories do matter. Do you care about how distribution happens of dietary protein? Um, way less than I used to. So um, now I'm mostly worried about how much you get in a day. And um, it's probably good to divide that into two meals instead of one. So if someone sort of bookended their eating window with uh, bowls of protein at both ends, I I think that's great. There also seems to be like a bolus effect to protein and, and muscle protein synthesis. So if you get like a meal with a large amount, it would be better than just having like an IV drip of like one gram every 10 minutes. You know what I mean? So I like this sort of uh, large amount at once bolus effect. Um, I do like to possibly go from, you know, one meal a day to at least two and have uh you know, um, just a, a longer period of time where you have amino acids available in your bloodstream. So yeah, other than that, not really. It's just the total amount for the day is overwhelmingly the most important. Uh, and then maybe just divvying it up into more than one meal and then trying to keep it bolus. I think these are helpful. Um, beyond that, not super worried about it. Excellent advice. You're talking about a protein hierarchy. Number one is how much protein you're getting and then dividing it into two meals at least or two meals and a snack. But two meals is certainly adequate depending on your capacity to eat. I really like that advice. When you think about fiber versus fat, where does fiber fall when you are designing a diet or, or telling your patients? Where does fiber fall versus fat? Well, okay. So first of all, the, the more carbs you're eating, the bigger deal fiber is. So if someone's eating, you know, less and less carbohydrate, I'm not as worried about fiber. Fiber seems to be uh, more and more important as the percentage of, of calories in your diet from carbohydrate goes up. So the more carbs you're eating, the more fiber you should be eating. So I'm almost more worried about a ratio between fiber and non-fiber carbohydrate 
than I am like fiber overall. But I do think it's a mistake to eat zero fiber. I think it is providing some um, satiety <clears throat> and for like hardly any calories. So you're just leaving money on the table if you're not eating some fiber and getting some satiety benefit from that. Uh, so I'm not like trying to nag people, oh, make sure you eat your, you know, 30 grams of fiber per day. But I am like, okay, let's look at the ratio of fiber to non-fiber carbs in the foods that you're choosing, because I think that's a big deal. Um, and so, yeah, for me, it's like you should be leveraging fiber to some extent because it's helpful. Um, and then you really just want to keep the ratio of fiber to non-fiber carbs uh, as high as you can. So give me an example of that. What does that look like? Great, great. Yeah, like so like let's say I, I buy some Wonder Bread and it's got um, a slice has, you know, 50 grams of carbs and one gram of fiber or zero grams of fiber. Uh, but then I got my, you know, my Ezekiel bread, my sprouted bread that's like, you know, super whole grain, whatever. It might have 25 grams of carbs and five grams of fiber. So it's like a, a five to one uh, non-fiber to fiber carbohydrate ratio versus the Wonder Bread, which is like 50 to zero or something like that. Um, so that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about. You just, um, if you're looking at a label, you just look at the sort of the rough ratio between total carbohydrate and fiber carbohydrate. And you just want the fiber to non-fiber ratio to be higher, you know, higher is better. And uh, so that's, that's mostly what I'm talking about. Thank you to Thesis for sponsoring this episode of the show. If you have been following me for any amount of time, you know that I love Thesis. It is the world's first customized nootropic company. What does that mean? Nootropics are nutrients found in nature or the human body. They enhance cognitive function. We talk a lot about the body. We talk a lot about muscle health, optimization. You're not going to get there if your brain is not functioning. If you are looking for enhancing your thinking, your focus, your energy, your mood, Thesis is the way to go. I use this company personally. I recommend it to all of my friends and my patients. By the way, while many companies take a one-size-fits-all approach, Thesis doesn't. It's not one supplement. There are multiple different formulations in which you will go to their website, you will take a quiz, you will answer questions, and you will get a starter kit with four different blend recommendations to try over the course of a month. They're an incredible company, incredible people. Head over to takethesis.com slash a Dr. Lion. That's takethesis.com slash a Dr. Lion. You can get your own customized thesis starter kit. Also, you can use the code Dr. Lion at checkout for a discount. Um, I really like that. Do, is there a number that you shoot for? For example, if you see th that it's less than X, you're out. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see it at like, you know, 15% um, or so. So like, you know, like a six to one um, fiber to nine fiber would be pretty good. You know, if it, something had 30 grams of carbs and five grams of fiber, that's pretty good. A five to one is even better. A four to one is really good. You'll see some like low carb tortillas that are just crushing it. And they're just like half fiber or more. They're made out of like, you know, flax seeds and just hay or something. Uh, so so you'll see a really wide spectrum from the Krispy Kreme donut, which is, you know, 100 grams of carbs and zero fiber, all the way down to just like some you know, super low carb tortilla thing. That's just basically all fiber. And so that's what you're looking at really. Do you have a favorite source? Do you have a, a favorite source of carbs for yourself personally? I absolutely do. So I like soluble fiber. Soluble fiber is really the best for satiety. And, um, <clears throat> you know, fruit is a pretty good source of this. And I, there are some fruits that I eat a lot of, uh, berries are my absolute favorite. Um, apples are second. So I eat a lot of apples ha has soluble fiber. Um, now, of course, all of this stuff has almost no protein. So this is like an, uh, you know, a side dish to something with protein in it, but it's an excellent, uh, accompaniment to, uh, some, some high protein food. You know what I'm saying? So I love fruit. I like, um, basically any kind of low sugar fruit, all of your peppers and your cucumbers and your tomatoes and your, um, olives and your avocados and all of your low sugar fruit. I love, I love all of your, um, 
fruit fruit as well. Like citrus is amazing. Lots of, you know, really high satiety per calorie, um, lots of fiber, lots of water, very low energy density. Uh, so I, yeah, but if you look to the ones I'm eating the most, it's probably fruit, mostly berries, apples, and then your low sugar fruit that people think are vegetables like cucumbers and tomatoes and peppers. And then, um, tubers as well. I eat a lot of carrots. I'll eat a lot of potatoes. I'm typically throwing those in the air fryer and not adding any fat to them. But those are some of my favorite carb sources. It's basically fruit, tubers, um, the low sugar fruit people think are vegetables and, uh, a few whole grains in there too. I eat like some air pop popcorn, maybe some uh, brown rice, that kind of thing. Do you worry about um, fructose, the fructose in the fruits? Uh, no, not at all. So, so uh, you know, I you know I have to ask these questions. I'm anticipating questions from our community about fructose because we did have one of these world. We had a, a world leading expert on fructose metabolism. Yeah. I'm, so basically fructose is bad in overfeeding uh, and fructose is bad in overfeeding when you get a lot of it all at once. So if you're just just pouring regular soda with high fructose corn syrup on top of a hypercaloric diet and someone who's already over fat, yeah, that's going to be mercilessly giving you fatty liver and it's bad. But saturated fat is just as bad as fructose. There's this, the uh, fructose and saturated fat are two sides of a coin where they're both empty calories. They're both bad in overfeeding. They're both bad in hypercaloric situations. They're both mercilessly driving fatty liver. And, um, uh, but they're both so super harmless if you're on a uh, low calorie diet, if you're hypocaloric, if you're thin, if you're metabolic healthy. Um, they are empty calories, true, but they're um, harmless. Uh, the dose makes the poison on all this stuff. So if you're thin and you're healthy and you're metabolically intact and you're not eating a hypercaloric diet, not too worried about fructose or saturated fat. However, because they are empty calories and because they are um, you know, not really that helpful other than being a pure energy source, you do want to keep them to a smaller percentage of your diet, which is probably why the guidelines say, you know, less than 10% of your calories should come from saturated fat and less than 10% should come from sugar. And that also um, sort of illustrates the fact that there are two sides of the same coin and they're both kind of bad and you don't want to eat tons of it. That's a, an interesting point. Do you, so you do believe that the guidelines did do an appropriate job for saturated fat and sugars in that perspective? Absolutely. Because these are both just empty calories that are frequently just unnecessarily added to the food supply, diluting out other things. So like, you know, saturated fat, let's, let's, uh, let's look at a wild animal, which has amazing macros, your venison, your extra lean ground beef. This is like just a crazy, awesome food, but I'm going to over, I'm going to overfeed a cow and make it the fattest cow you've ever seen. And then I'm actually going to make ground beef and throw more fat into that and make the cheap 70, 30 ground beef in the grocery store, which is actually only 18% protein, um, has a super high energy density, uh, super low protein percent, um, kind of actually horrible from a satiety per calorie point of view or any point of view. And what's in there that's making it bad, just a crap ton of saturated fat that you generated by overfeeding an animal and then maybe even adding more when you made the ground beef. So yeah, saturated fat is bad. This is the, the reason why red meat looks bad in all your epidemiological studies is because they've overfed the animals, they've added more fat later to make it cheaper, and you basically end up with a horribly protein dilute monstrosity that just has a bunch of saturated fat from the overfeeding agricultural practices and then the economic drivers of just diluting out all your cheap meat. So your hot dogs and your burger patties and your super cheap $70, 30 a pound ground beef in the grocery store. This is all terrible. And it's terrible because of all these saturated fat that's been added for profit by agriculture and industry, blah, blah, blah. Fructose is the same way. I'm going to take a sugar cane or a sugar beet or whatever. I'm going to, you know, press it with rollers. I'm going to um, squeeze out all the sugar. I'm going to dry it. I'm going to crystallize it. I'm going to sprinkle it on every single thing I eat and then boom, I'm just 
putting fructose in everything it makes it more palatable. You can eat way more of it. Um, it's just pure empty calories. And it's that literally fructose and saturated fat are the flip sides of the same coin. One on the carb side, one on the animal side, one on the plant, uh, plant side. And I'm sorry, one on carb, one on fat, one on plant, one on animal. They're the same thing. Flip side of the same coin. And if you really want to give somebody fatty liver, like your mouse in the lab, you just overfeed them with both sugar and saturated fat, like your high sugar butter diets are just making fatty liver like crazy in the lab. A few really good points that you made. <clears throat> Number one, the idea that red meat is bad for you, and it seems to not do well in a lot of the epidemiological studies, which is essentially large population and, and low quality evidence because of the saturated fat content or you know the overfeeding aspect of it, a really good point. It's not the red meat per se. Red meat, they're venison, bison, there's lots of lean, lean steaks. It is the likely over the overfeeding effect. I have a question on satiation, which is really kind of where you've got. So I've known you for years, Ted, and originally there was a lot of talk about protein and fiber, and now you've really evolved the conversation through practice to this satiety model. Do you think that when individuals are overfed via saturated fat, we'll, we'll start with saturated fat, that it deranges their satiety or their capacity to have satiation, meaning as they are overfeeding or going through periods, whether they are emotionally overeating or overeating because they're making bad choices, do you think it's a feed forward mechanism? Uh, yeah, I think to some extent it is. So as people get more and more insulin resistant, their, um, the, their protein percentage requirement actually goes up because they're burning more protein when they're insulin resistant. And they're, that is a that's why obesity didn't just go up and plateau out. It just keeps climbing because as you get more and more over fat and more and more insulin resistant, you actually need a higher and higher protein percentage, but you're not eating that. So you just kind of continue gaining weight forever. Also, um, the hedonic factors are huge. If you're constantly exposed to very hedonic, hyper palatable, super tasty food, um, that kind of resets your dopamine system where that's what you just need to eat now. And everything you eat has to be 10 out of 10. It has to be like all you'll eat is the the Haagen-Dazs and the Krispy Kreme and the Ben and Jerry's. You're not going to eat just like a protein shake because you have this um, feed forward hedonic effect where everything just has to be more and more tasty, almost like, like a drug addict, you know, using higher and higher doses. So the hedonics feed forward the insulin resistance and over fatness and protein requirement is feed forward. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, all, you're, you're totally right. All of this stuff is kind of <laughs> uh, feed forward, which is why LBC keeps climbing and didn't just, uh, you know, go up by the amount of sugar we put on everything and then plateau out. Um, speak more about that. Uh, talk more about um, what we're actually consuming and where, the numbers of obesity are driving to it. That's a really good point. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, <clears throat> so like, you know, basically 75% of the world is over fat. 92% uh, of Americans are over fat. And, and I'm going to um, stop you. I'm going to stop you right there because I bet you. So we talk about them, 70% of them being over fat. I, we would also say then 70% would be under muscled. Yeah, absolutely. Well, <laughs> So, like, I, I do have patients who... Um, quality of muscle. Quality of muscle. Yeah, I have some patients who, because they weigh so much, they do have an okay amount of muscle if they weighed way less. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, but I absolutely agree. There's a, I, I have an avalanche of patients with um, normal weight obesity or sarcopenic obesity. Now, this is the worst thing ever. It's someone who's so sedentary and just sits on the couch and has no muscle at all. And so even though they look hugely fat, they actually don't weigh that much. <laughs> uh, and this is, you're absolutely right. There is a simultaneously an under muscled crisis because we've basically disconnected movement from survival. So nobody ever has to move at all. You can literally just sit on your couch your entire life. You've got Uber Eats on your phone, uh, your whole job's on Zoom. 
Uh, you never have to even stand up. You can just live your whole life without moving. So everybody's simultaneously over fat and under muscled. I know, yeah, I totally agree. This is absolutely true. And to the point that you know, we're measuring body fat and maybe you're using, are you using an in-body or are you using DEXA? What are you using? I, I mean, I don't do a lot of body composition measurements with my patients, to be honest, because I can just look at them and tell them they're over fat. So it's not that helpful. I'm mostly just doing low budget stuff like waist to height measurements. That's um, where I'm at. I, I do have a, like, a, you know, skin calipers in the office. We do DEXA in the, in the office, but um I'm not like regularly doing those to track anything because you can just measure your waist circumference at the belly button and know exactly what your problem is. And how do you, what number do you like to hit and how would someone do it? So if someone is like, wow, this is so great. I don't have to go to the doctor. I don't need to get an in-body scan. I don't need to get a DEXA. What do I have to do, Ted? Got it. Got it. So waist to height uh, ratio is incredibly powerful, incredibly important. Um, super, super good and free. So you measure your waist circumference at the belly button with your abdomen completely relaxed. Uh, then you cry because it's so high and it's so much higher that, than your pants size, right? You know, so like I have so many patients who they're, they're shoving their, their themselves into a, you know, a 32 jeans or whatever, but you measure their abdomen at the belly button and it's like 40. And so you measure your waist, add the belly button, abdomen fully relaxed, divide that by your height. You want that to be less than half your height. So weight should be um, less than half your height. Um, and it's uh, it's going to work on almost everyone, uh, even people who look kind of skinny. Um, I have a lot of skinny fat patients who look pretty thin, like nobody would ever think they have any issues. But if you actually measure their waist at the belly button, their abdomen fully relaxed, it's uh yeah, it's not <laughs> it's not always as low as you wished it was. So that's a really great metric for just about anyone. And it's free. Like you said, waist height measurement is very helpful, less than half. Um what did you say? Less than half your your height. Right. Your waist should be less than half your height. So if I'm, you know, 75 inches tall, my waist circumference should be 37.5 or lower. I mean, that's probably a bad example with <laughs> too much math. But like, uh, you know, if you're if you're 60 inches tall, your waist should be less than 30 inches at the belly button. Thank you to Timeline Nutrition for sponsoring this episode of the show. When we talk about muscle health, aging, the human body, the energy generating machine that we are going through life with. I have to say that if I could have developed one supplement, it would have been MitoPure. MitoPure has a compound in it called urolithin A. And urolithin A is what we call a postbiotic, and it helps increase your energy by affecting your mitochondria, which is extraordinary. And if you're interested in living a forever strong or muscle-centric lifestyle, then you understand you cannot be healthy without healthy muscle. As you get older, especially, and we'll just say older, for people in their 40s, one must think about the health of their mitochondria. And that is why I am hooked on Timeline Nutrition's MitoPure. You can try their MitoPure Berry or ginger powder into your daily smoothie routine. They have a vanilla protein shake with MitoPure. They also have soft gels, which are great when you're on the go. I use them myself. Head over to TimelineNutrition.com slash Dr. Lion. That's TimelineNutrition.com slash Dr. Lion, and you will get 10% off your order. Really easy to do. And, and I'll mention... I, you know, part of me agrees with you. Do we need to continuously measure body fat? You, you know, one would know perhaps looking at themselves or, or doing a measurement like this because we don't have great ways of getting a, a wonderful comprehensive picture. And what do I mean by that? We're not directly measuring skeletal muscle. You could have an individual who is over fat, and if you measure their skeletal muscle, it looks as if they have enough, but the reality is that is not healthy muscle. It is typically marbled. It is not necessarily as metabolically effective as it should be because the tissue changes. Skeletal muscle as an organ system, that tissue changes. You get fat infiltration. 
decrease in flux, meaning you're not moving glycogen, you're not utilizing these fatty acid byproducts the way that you should. And um, again, we've really been hyper focused on body fat. And the reality is just like fructose and saturated fat, body fat and muscle are opposite sides of, of the same coin, essentially. Right, right. And and you're totally right. You can uh, all these measurements are just really rough estimates. Nothing's accurate. Um <clears throat> DEXA is kind of inaccurate, skin fold is inaccurate, uh your impedance is inaccurate. Uh the only way the best you we've got is some four compartment model and an MRI and it's gonna cost you thousands of dollars. And even then, even if you knew exactly what your composition was, it's a Sisyphean daily struggle the rest of your life to constantly get more muscle and less fat. And you have to worry about that. It's like a war of grams every day and every time you eat and you're trying to get more muscle and less fat. And you're going to be doing that forever. And health is uh, never owned, only rented. And the rent is due daily. And so like it, even if you had a snapshot that looked pretty good, uh, it's going to go downhill after Christmas or Thanksgiving or the, your, the cruise you're going on. So it doesn't even matter. It's like, um, let's pretend I did a dex on someone and it sucks. You're too fat. You don't have enough muscle. Now, what are you going to do about it? And then, oh, by the way, you have to do that every week for the rest of your life. So I, I just don't find it's, I, it's entertaining to track these things, but it's not value added for me, to be honest. Like I've no, never and had how long have you been in practice. You've been in practice. Uh, how long have you been in practice? Uh, let's see. There was dinosaurs and then, uh, um, I may listen. So Ted, I know these answers, but the reality is uh, it's so fun that Ted and I get to chat and, um, you guys are all involved in this conversation. I'm asking because the more advanced a clinician is, there are certain components of the body or certain ways of practice that, um, you know, we see it's very cyclical in the beginning of our practice. We talk about this in the beginning of your practice as a physician, if, you know, we do have lots of providers listening. You are testing and tracking everything, literally everything. And by the way, that is extremely overwhelming for the patient as you advance. I mean, I'm in my second decade of practice as you advance in to practice, you do less, you are hyper-focused on more and you are hyper focused on the things that truly move the needle. I bet you if if I put a gun to Ted's head, which I'm not going to and I said, is diet or exercise more effective in moving body composition and and creating change in homeostasis, he would say exercise. Uh oh, probably so. Probably so. But it's so I right. Mean, not that I'm holding it up, but but again, that is very difficult to impart, which is why you know, you can't really do one without the other. You really have to nail in nutrition. You, you can be training like a maniac, but you do have to have your your nutrition in balance. And he's done a wonderful job at that. So we've talked about protein. We've talked about how to prioritize it. We've talked about carbohydrates and fats. When you are looking at the overall picture, what are some numbers that you would give? And how do you think about it if, for example, in your model of a two meal a day eating how much are you consuming? Are you worried about um, the dose of carbohydrates that then stimulates insulin, say, for example, over 50 grams? Or are you worried about the impact of a dose of saturated fat at that first meal? <clears throat> got it, got it. So yeah, so protein, basically targeting protein first, uh, gram per pound of ideal body weight based on your height, um, and then dividing into you know two or three meals or two meals in a snack. Um, in like an eight hour eating window, that would be kind of ideal for me. Um, the, uh, fat is basically like if you're, if you're dieting, you, you want to keep uh, fat to about, um, half a gram per pound of ideal body weight based on your height. So Wait, I have gram to stop you. I have to stop you. I'm stopping you. I, this was on my question list. How do you determine ideal body weight? I'm going to tell you how I determine ideal body weight, but there's lots of talk about, because everyone is going to be thinking, okay, I got to calculate this. How do you determine ideal body weight? Got it. Got it. So, um, you know, if like, if I'm just looking at someone and I don't care about gender or anything, I basically do some fancy calculation of uh, solving for a BMI of 22, what your height would be in meters. Um, I mean, you enter your height in meters, solve for a 
what kilograms would get you to a BMI of 22. But that involves like square roots and a lot of math. And it's kind of, uh, <laughs> you have to be a math leap just to even understand that. But you know how um, a BMI is kilograms per meter squared. Mm-hmm. And if you uh, just take a BMI of 22 for everybody on the planet, men, women, large, small, whatever, just as a rough average, and then you enter your height in meters squared and you solve that for kilograms, you will get like ideal um, body weight for pretty much anybody uh, ind- indiscriminately, whether, you know, they're male or female or whatever. But like on a practical level, I, I did have like in the book, I, I had a little quick and easy calculation where for women, you get 100 pounds for the first five feet of height. And then you get five pounds for each an additional inch over five feet. So if you're um, if you're five foot tall, even uh, you should weigh 100 pounds. If you're five four, that would be 120 pounds. So 100 pounds for the first five feet, and then five pounds for each inch over five feet, which is four inches, which is four times five twenty. So that'd be 120. Uh, men exact same thing, except men are allowed to weigh 110 for the first five feet, um, and then five five pounds for each inch over that if you know what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> so like if a, a male was 5'4", he could weigh, uh, you know, 110 plus 4 times 5 is 20, so 130. Um, that is like, you know, really easy, anybody can do it, way to look at it. Uh, when I'm designing calculators for ideal body weight based on height, I'm basically solving for kilograms using your height in meters and a BMI of 22. Interesting. Interesting. You want to hear my way of doing it? So, so dear. I mean, because listen, there's no, it's very difficult. How do we know? The, and you, you may totally not agree with this because again, there is no, it's really difficult to say what is your ideal body weight. I think the last time if someone was ever fit. So for example, um, I don't know, in college, I weighed 110 pounds pretty lean and fit. That's my ideal body weight. Mm -hmm. The last time, you know, I look at my husband um, in college, he was pretty skinny, (laughs) uh, Shane, but his ideal body weight's 200 pounds. The last time he was super fit, he was at 200 pounds. And I think picking a weight in which you felt great at is, could be just as effective. I know it's not scientific, but I have found, and also pushing yourself a little bit, I often pick, and we often have patients pick a college weight. Yeah. And that works for old people like me because we weren't always fat, but that's not working for the the next generation because like they had like childhood obesity and they were never at a good weight. And so it's uh, scarily becoming less and less uh, uh, like that's going to work less and less going forward, unfortunately. But yeah, I do actually like that for older people. It's like, you know, yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, with this whole childhood obesity thing, we, we have to then begin to think, where do we set our standards in terms of nutrition? We then, uh, you know, in my mind, we have to go back to what are the calories that they're, and this is a, a, going to be a huge challenge because the people listening to this podcast are doing the thing. But what about everybody else who is outside of the arena? What are the recommendations that we're going to tell them? What are we going to tell them that the RDA is, you, you know, you should have what, 48 grams of protein, depending on how, uh, how much you weigh, this is, it's going to be a challenge. We're, yeah. We're yeah, going to be I, in for some real struggle because it's again, a disaster. Yeah. Hmm. That, yeah. Just go look really at a, interesting. Yeah. Look at a school lunch, look at a hospital lunch, look at a nursing home lunch. Uh, it just makes you want to cry. It's disgusting. It's disturbing. And protein is what's really getting thrown under the bus on all of this. I know it's so odd. And it's odd because I think that there's a political agenda there. I think that there's a money agenda there. And when I say politics, I mean, we have to account for the whole world. It's not just us. And there's a lot of challenges with animal-based products. And even taking out the animal-based products, even the plant-based products, how are we going to uh, prioritize? That's not really the message that we're getting. It, it truly is um, reduce dietary protein, which is the worst piece of advice I, I could ever give somebody. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I I hear you. I mean, the, the whole plant-based thing, I mean, 
okay, they might be right that fiber is good and they might be right that lower energy density is good and they might be right that you're going to have a less uh, hedonic um, factors in your diet, but they're really missing the protein angle um, for the most part, the big picture. And, and uh, a lot of the plant agenda is like, oh, you're already eating too much protein. Don't even worry about that. And I just really don't agree with that. And that's problematic. And if you have a bigger view, you can see, okay, there are some um, advantages to this plant-based thing, which might be fiber and energy density and the lower hedonics. I agree. But they're missing out on the protein side. So why don't you actually look at both sides, combine them all, and kind of, you know, take some sort of middle road where you can actually see the pluses and minuses on both sides of the political aisle. So I, I basically hate politics. I'm super apolitical. And I can just immediately see all the good and bad on both sides. And so I'm just squarely in this alt middle zone where I'm just like, uh, just absolutely aghast at the extremes on either side. And I do the same thing with carbs versus fat. I do the same thing with plants versus animals. And I do think there's this sort of agnostic, neutral middle ground where you can actually see the good and bad on both sides and kind of weigh it out. And it's probably optimal somewhere in between. Absolutely. Um, and then the, the just to kind of round out I don't know if I, I got the answer for the question because I'm sure people want the tactical aspect of it. Do you care about the dosing per meal of carbohydrates and oh, right. fat? Okay, so fat less so. Like fat can fat's fairly passive. It takes a very, very long time to be absorbed and to, you know, it gets packaged into chylomicrons and it filters through your lymphatics and it gets dumped out in the thoracic duct and goes to your liver and gets repackaged and ends up in your fat cells. And uh, so the timing of fat, I really don't worry about too much. You probably want enough with each uh, meal to add to the longer term satiety, um, but it can kind of just be distributed evenly and, uh, you know, more or less however you want. Carbohydrate is a little more strategic. So um, I think carbs could have an ergogenic benefit. Um, pre what do you mean by that? Uh, mean by uh, that? So like some people, if they eat carbohydrate right before they work out, they might have a better workout. They might um, be able to uh, perform better either at cardio or resistance training. So there seems to be a bit of an ergogenic effect to carbohydrate, kind of like caffeine. And so it's almost like a pre-workout effect. So um, I, I think using carbs strategically and the things that carbs do that I think are good are possibly ergogenic before or during a workout, um, possibly speeding up recovery after workout, you know, and, or if you're doing multiple bouts of working out in a day. So like if you're, you know, playing soccer for four hours, you might want to drink your Gatorade somewhere in there. So it's like, uh, basically timing carbs around workouts before, during, or after, and then possibly, um, in the evening, uh, there, there might be, uh, rest and digest parasympathetic mode benefit to carbohydrate, which is why so many people, uh, backload their carbs and eat them later in the evening, because you seem to trigger more of a parasympathetic rest and digest state. So, um, I like using either backloading carbs later in the day for um, just like people, some people sleep better um, or just using them around workouts before, during, or after. Um, and so like uh, carbs is more of a strategic thing around exercise for me. Special thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. The name is Inside, like inside your body, tracker.com slash Dr. Lion. Why do you care about Inside Tracker? Because you care about your blood work. You must understand what is going on with your muscle health. One way to do that is not just by tracking strength, but also by tracking blood markers. Things like fasting insulin, blood glucose, triglycerides. These are all markers that will tell you where your metabolic health is and where your muscle health is. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon and you'll get 20% off their entire Inside Tracker store. I use their mobile phlebotomist. I get a report. It's super easy. I have a ton of friends that are practitioners that also use Inside Tracker, not just for their patients, but for themselves. As a healthcare provider, you can go to Inside Tracker 
and you'll see the Inside Tracker Pro, which enables coaches, health professionals to provide premium and personalized services by leveraging Inside Tracker's analysis. I know that's a lot, but here's what I'm just going to ask you to do. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion, and you will get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. And do you dose it? For example, I tell my patients that if they're going to have a meal, it's to not exceed outside of training 40 or so grams of carbohydrates because I don't want a secondary insulin response. Again, if you're eating all these vegetables or some of these fibrous carbs, um, potentially you could go higher. But I give them the baseline recommendation that 50 grams, 40 to 50 grams or less if you're not training, the rest of the carbohydrates are earned during exercise or post-exercise. The amount that I give them is, I'll say, for every one hour of uh, moderate intense training where your heart is over 120 beats per minute or so, I might offer them anywhere from 40 to 60 grams of carbohydrates or uh, something like that. Do you have a number that you shoot for? Yeah, yeah, roughly. So like, you know, per day, I'm thinking about a gram per pound of ideal body weight in carbohydrate, similar to a gram per pound in protein, um, with the caveat that you want the fiber to non-fiber ratio as high as you can get. Um, and then I'm a little bit less worried about, you know, per meal, if the fiber to non-fiber ratio is high enough, it, that'll kind of take care of itself, I think. But um, I, I do agree with what you're saying. You could add in an extra, you know, like a gram per minute uh, for all the high intensity exercise you're doing. You know, if you do an hour of high intensity glycolytic exercise, definitely another 60 grams of carbs. Sure. Um, so I like that. It's, you know, you're going to eat, you know, roughly a gram per pound. Uh, you're going to divvy it up with your meals or use it around exercise or um, in the evening. And then you're going to um, basically keep the fiber to non-fiber ratio as high as you can get. And uh, that that's kind of how I would, uh, make my carbohydrate recommend recommendation. What about saturated fats or fats around training? Do you have any concern, worry about it? Just. Uh, I, it, it's so passive and it's so delayed and there's just a no, nobody's getting an ergogenic benefit from fat. Nobody's getting like anything right away. So <clears throat> the, the carbohydrate is so immediate. It's, it's definitely more time sensitive and more of a timing issue. It's a way more tactical. Fat is not tactical at all. So you just uh, in, mix it in with your meals. So you get a little more satiety and you want to make sure you don't want to go less than 20% of your calories from fat pretty much ever. Uh, probably somewhere in the 20 to 40% of your calories is good. You know, right in the middle of 30, 35% fat would be awesome. So, yeah, so you just you have to have some fat in there for a bunch of reasons, and it doesn't really matter when. The timing is the least important when it comes to fat, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely agree with you, and the evidence would suggest a diet lower than 20% fat can affect hormonal status. I see this often with men, particularly the lower their fat intake below 20%. Again, um, these are just individual cases anecdotally, but their testosterone decreases. And you will definitely see the information in the literature about lower fat diets and potentially impacting hormonal regulation. What about exercise? What kind of exercise? Where do you throw exercise if someone is looking to be less fat and more muscle, just improve body composition? What's your got go it, got it. Yeah, so basically there, there are three forms of exercise that everybody <clears throat> should be doing. The first one is resistance training, right? You have to put maximum tension in all of your muscles and you have to give your body the signal that it needs more muscle or you're going to die. That's the only way your body will make more muscle. You can't, you can't create muscle by just eating more protein. That's like pushing rope. Uh, you have to demand more muscle from your body by telling your body you're going to die if you don't have more muscle and that's doing things to failure you know so i like uh compound exercises uh you know push pull legs hinge uh you want to do at least twice a week full body to failure um three times a week probably slightly better uh but you're basically trying to do big compound movements all the way to failure and uh that's resistance training that everyone should be absolutely doing you're never going to get more muscle without it Super critical. The second thing that everyone should be doing is um, 
uh, cardiovascular exercise, right? You want the positive adaptations from cardio. You want uh, a higher VO2 max because that's more associated with longevity than pretty much any other number you can measure on a human. So you want to challenge your cardiovascular system regularly. I like people to get maybe not to maximum heart rate, but, you know, close, 90, 95%. Uh, at least once or twice a week, you're trying to, um, uh, you know, of course, talk to your doctor first because there's somebody out there with a, you know, every time you do maximum effort cardio, uh, you have a 0.00001% chance of just dropping dead because you have some widow maker, uh, left anterior descending <laughs> a thing that you don't know about. But um, the vast majority of the time, you're just going to be better and stronger after doing this sort of thing. But as long as you're healthy, you want to be um, approaching maximum heart rate once or twice a week, at least to try to get positive adaptations, which are going to improve your VO2 max and your cardiac output. And um, how your, intense? Uh, how intense what? are we talking? Uh, I, I'm talking, you know, uh, rate of perceived exertion of 10. You know, you really want to uh, kind of max out. You're trying to push out of your comfort zone. And as you crank the intensity up, uh, you get better and better adaptations. It's just like resistance training. The closer you get to failure, those reps for close to failure are where uh, you're getting all of the bang for your buck. And when it comes to cardio adaptations, you're getting a lot of those at the higher output levels. Like you're just not going to get the same thing from, from walking, for example. So <clears throat> you're trying to get a bunch of adaptations from exercise, but you're trying to increase speed, you're trying to increase power, you're trying to increase skill, you're trying to increase endurance, and you're not going to get all those things without doing some high-end cardio. So um, I like people at least once a week to do more of an endurance cardio, at least a half an hour um, at a fairly high heart rate. I like people to try to approach maximum heart rates, um, you know, at least once a week, if not more. Uh, because of the adaptations you're going to get. So you're trying to get a uh, cardio adaptation. So everyone should be doing a high end cardio an endurance cardio, and then just cardio more higher volume zone two, zone three, whatever you want. Um, <clears throat> so you've got resistance, resistance and cardio. And again, you have to have both of them. just like diet and exercise are equally important and you have to do both. Uh, you have to do resistance and cardio. You're never going to be in optimal health without both of those. So yes, you want to be strong and yes, you want more muscle, but you also want to be fast as hell and you want to be, uh, have tons of endurance. And so, um, resistance and cardio both. And then the third form of exercise that everyone should be doing is just general movement, a high step count, a high level of non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, just walking around a lot, you know, our, you know, your hunter gatherers are getting 20,000 steps a day and we're getting 3000 steps a day. And, uh, so you just want to uh, be at least moderately active because there are so many people out there who are just constantly thinking about their diet, 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 diet. They're, they're just really white knuckling the diet. Everything has to be unprocessed and paleo and they're looking at their macros, but they're never doing enough exercise and they're never going to get exactly where they want to be. And half those people would be better off just doing a, just a way higher volume of exercise and then eating whatever the hell they want. Because exercise, as your caloric burn goes up from exercise, uh, your body just very smoothly regulates intake to expenditure uh, perfectly. And you'll never get that at low energy expenditure. So if you're just sitting on the couch and really trying to dial in your diet harder and harder and harder, you're just not going to get to where you want to be. And so a lot of these people need to think way less about their diet and just uh, crank the volume of exercise way higher. And so you really want to be pulling the diet and exercise levers equally hard and uh, not get too freaked out about one or the other. <laughs> that makes me think of the biggest misconceptions that are just discussed. What do you think the, the biggest, if you were to pick... We'll go to three. How about three? Or maybe two. Whatever you want. The biggest misconceptions related to fat loss that we're seeing now. Oh, wow. <clears throat> um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Ooh, that's tough. The three biggest, li like from like mainstream media type thing? Yeah, anywhere. Um, yeah. And, uh, and maybe they're the old things like 
just restrict calories and walk more. Um, I don't know. Do you think that there is a a certain misconceptions? I think one big one is basically a monofocal approach where you're just looking at one thing. So like, okay, it's just all about fructose. Just don't eat fructose. Look at all the fructose. Or it's just about um, animal foods. Okay, if we were all vegan, if we all went plant-based, or just looking at, you know, something like fat, you know, you just need to eat the, the lowest fat you possibly can. So if you're anytime you're doing a monofocal approach where it's just carbs, it's just fructose, it's just fat, it's just saturated fat, it's just calories, um, it's just exercise, uh, you're you're really going to get like 10% better and then just completely fail. And you really have to integrate all of these things at once. And so everybody's right about something and it's really all of them together. And it's a higher protein percent and more fiber and lower energy density and less hedonics and less processed and doing cardio and your step count and resistance training and muscle quality. And all of these things are like kind of equally important. And if you're not looking at all of them together, you're just not gonna, you know, get the whole picture. It's just... Uh, monofocal reliance. And then every time you read a clickbait article, it's about one thing. It's like, you know, a, a, you know, everyone's eating way too much saturated fat or you're already getting plenty of protein. You know, we're obsessed with protein, you know, or it's like um, there's a there's a fiber problem in America. It's like you, you just focus on one thing and it's just really not going to explain everything and it's really not going to get you there. And I'm definitely worried when somebody tries to just blame everything on one thing. Very smart answer, putting you on the spot. Very smart answer. I I could not do better. That is an excellent, excellent answer. What do you tell or have you had people that you find are weight loss resistant or their body composition just doesn't move? Have you had that experience with your patients? Yeah. And and it's especially people who've just always been obese. So I have patients, both their uh, parents are morbidly obese. They were uh, morbidly obese as a child, in adolescence, as an adult. And they've had so much fat cell hyperplasia. Basically, your fat cells can either hypertrophy where they get bigger in diameter or they can uh, undergo hyperplasia, which is where you multiply them and get way more and more and more fat cells. And these people have, you know, maybe 10 times as many fat cells as someone who is never overweight. And they hit this major wall on body fat percent because they, you know, let's say they were 50% body fat at one point and they have 10 times more adipocytes than everyone else. They can diet down and shrink down all their fat cells a lot, but they get just so hungry at, at this a shrunken adipocyte level, their their leptin resistance or whatever you want to call it, um, their leptin to adiponectin ratios are all screwed up because they have so much fat tissue hyperplasia that they can only get so low and they're just starving out of their mind. It's like if I tried to get down to 5% body fat, I, I would be the same level of hunger that they have when they're 30% body fat because of how much fat cell hyperplasia they've undergone earlier in life. You know what I mean? And that is just a really tough situation. And I, you know, honestly, I do prescribe drugs for people who've had this just lifelong programmed obesity. I am prescribing GLP-1 receptor agonist, your trizepatide, your Zepbound, your Wegovy, your uh, Munjaro, your Ozempic, your semaglutide. I'm, you know, using all these drugs and they are effective and they are basically just massively overdriving satiety signaling in a way that you could never accomplish with food. And that does seem to be helpful, especially for people who've just always been overweight um, because it's so hard for them to get to a normal weight. It's the same amount of difficulty it would be for me to be like stage lean bodybuilder style. You know what I mean? Those are about the same degree of difficulty. So yeah, definitely people who've been fat forever, super, 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 super tough for them to get all the way down to their goal. What do you do on the flip side of that? You know, we talk about fat and muscle, the opposite sides of the same coin. Do you then prescribe something for skeletal muscle health? What are your thoughts on that? 
Oh, well, I mean, if someone has low androgens, uh, yeah, I might like, you know, if you're a hypogonadal, um, I might be prescribing, you know, testosterone or something like that. But um, typically, no, it's really just protein and lifting for most people. Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. I would love to highlight their micro factor. You know, people ask me all the time, what kind of foods do I recommend? What kind of diet? And the reality is humans get into this behavior of eating the same thing over and over and over again. And that also means that they get the same nutrients over and over again. And that is one reason why I recommend micro factor. And this is a complete daily nutrient pack. It has antioxidants, it has CoQ10, essential fatty acids, it even has a fruit and veggie cap, a multivitamin. The big picture is you're not going to get everything that you need just by eating food, especially if you are one of those people that just gets into the rut of eating. That is why diversifying foods and diversifying supplements can be very helpful. If you are not taking a multivitamin, I strongly suggest Micro Factor. They're complete daily nutrient packs. Super easy to travel with. You don't have to lay out the whole pill box. Everything comes in one small pack. You can grab a handful, throw it in your suitcase, grab it for when you need it. Head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. You know, I think in an ideal world that eventually we'll get to a place in medicine, we have pretty set standards for how we're treating obesity, which again, I do. I feel like we have an obesity problem. I always say we don't. We do, but I, I don't believe that that's at the root. But we have standards and treatment protocols put into place to deal with someone who is obese or having fat cell hyperplasia, yet we ignore the musculoskeletal health issue and even the medications available. Sarcopenia wasn't an ICD-10 diagnosis until 2016. Obesity was finally a diagnosis in 2013. The perspective that we have has to change so that we can then be more effective at treatment because those with fat cell hyperplasia or those with exceedingly low muscle mass, the the Skeletal muscle system um, can be somewhat blunted. Muscle protein synthesis effect can be blunted. And it really does people a disservice if we cannot prescribe things that augment skeletal muscle health. And we're so restricted that it has to be based on hypogonadism or low levels of hormones because it's just a matter of time before the skeletal muscle health is going to catch up to them. Again, these are these are just my thoughts and I'm I'm hoping collectively as physicians we can really begin to move these guidelines and and bring in muscle centric medicine and and create guidelines for that. It would be really really helpful for people. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And even like, you know, postmenopausal women with uh um severe osteoporosis and sarcopenia, anabolic agents are probably way better than bisphosphonates and uh, protein and lifting and anabolics are probably where it's at. And you can probably just walk into the room and just glance at someone and look at their appendicular lean mass and be like, oh my God, you need way more protein. You need to be lifting. <laughs> you might even need an anabolic if you're you know, a postmenopausal exactly. female with uh, undetectable estrogen and testosterone. And so you're like all over that. But the average person, it's not even on their radar. Like nobody in the clinic is talking about muscle amount or quality or any of this stuff. And you're right. That should be that, you know, it's like, you know, how much can you bench press should be like, uh, you know, what are your vital signs? It's like, you know, how much can you deadlift? Uh, what's your, you know, dead hang time? What's your, you know, it's like, what um, ratio of your body weight can you overhead press? These should all be like on your chart along with your blood pressure. And so like you're preaching to the choir. I like really appreciate your muscle centric approach and it's a massive huge big deal and uh if everyone was dialing that in uh it would be enormous well maybe as i begin to put together the board for muscle centric medicine i can count you in absolutely yes please <laughs> definitely i would i would love it 
What are some of the biomarkers that you're looking at in your clinic? Things that you think are really important? Right, right. Well, <clears throat> kind of like you said earlier, now that I've been out of practice for, you know, uh, are out of residency and in practice. Since for, dinosaurs were alive. Yeah, I got out of residency in 2000, believe it or not. And I used to do so much more lab testing. I did all this, you know, functional medicine training and I was checking all these crazy labs. And um, the the with age, you get like this wisdom and you kind of realize that some of this stuff actually doesn't really matter. And so I do less and less and less testing. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but if you go to like a, a naturopath who's fresh out of school and has no real good feel of how everything works. There are going to be thousands of dollars of shotgun labs. on you, you're, you've got your reverse T3 and like all these crazy, crazy things that are just so not helpful. And the longer I do this, the less and less I look at in terms of uh, lab testing. So it's a very, very short list of things that I'm looking at, but I do like, Hemoglobin A1C, that's a critical test that I'm doing in everybody. Um, I do like fasting lipids and I'm looking at um, triglycerides, especially very, very useful to see how- Number, do you do you want to share the numbers? So you guys, fasting triglycerides is a um, certainly one of the things of that we think about for insulin resistance and just metabolic dysfunction. What number? What numbers are you looking at? Right, right. So basically, um, you want fa- uh, you know a fasting blood draw, no calories, nine to twelve hours, and you want your triglycerides to be under a hundred. Um, anyone with triple digit triglycerides is has an issue, and if you hit you know one twenty, one thirty. Uh, you're severely insulin resistant. And of course the textbook is like under 150 is normal, but it just gets worse and worse, you know, uh, anything above basically hundred. So lower is better. Um, you definitely want to be double digits instead of triple digits under hundred. Um, and that's, um, a really useful test in my opinion. Uh, so yeah, A1C, I'm looking at that a lot. Uh, fasting lipids, I'm looking at that. I'm looking at, um, yeah, uh, and of course, I'm also in anyone who's struggling. I'm checking uh, thyroid, I'm checking testosterone, I am checking some of these other hormones. Um, but the uh, you know, and everyone who comes in gets a you know a complete blood count, conference metal panel, A one C lib is thyroid, these kinds of things. But I'm not doing a lot of other fancy advanced testing beyond that because it's just not that helpful. Because at the end of the day, everyone needs more cardio, a better diet higher protein to energy ratio, uh, higher satiety per calorie, um, you know, more lifting, more cardio, more muscle, less fat. These are all Sisyphean things that you have to work on every day forever. And it's, you're playing the long game and it's a marathon and not a sprint. And so whatever your labs are today, I just pretend I checked them, they suck. And now you need to work harder in the kitchen and in the gym. Right. And the actual numbers are not that helpful. I, I just love that, that you're saying this because, again, you've been in practice for quite some time and it ends up being full circle. We can do these fancy things that, yes, some people need them. We have to build the foundation. We have to get the foundation right. Once you build the foundation, you get to have a lot more flexibility in the fun stuff, whether it's red light or sauna therapy, all things cold plunging, things I love. I do all of these things. But building the foundation for long-lasting health and um, the trajectory of one's health and wellness is, is so critical. You have – we had one of your um, business partners or, or medical partners on. we talking about an app, about satiety. Before we close out, I'd love for you to mention it where everyone can find you, find the app, et cetera. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've been working with Dr. Andreas Einfeld, another awesome primary care family medicine doctor like us. You know, we're we're the greatest. <laughs> Let's face it. Um, so uh, Dr. Einfeld of Diet Doctor fame uh, and I developed this uh, or with his Diet Doctor team developed this HAVA app, H-A-V-A. Um, you can check out the website at HAVA.co. Uh, there's an app for, you know, on the Google Play Store and on the uh, App Store on iPhones. And it's basically an app that just calculates satiety per calorie of foods. And it's looking at things like protein percent, uh, energy density, fiber fraction, and hedonic factors. And basically, uh, you know, you put in your extra lean ground beef and you've got like an 80 out of 100. 
spectacular. And then like a cookie is it literally a zero because the hedonic factors are just going to make you eat a ton of them uh, for no protein or water or fiber or this tidy calories, you know, literally zero. And so it's just a very interesting way of looking at your diet from a qualitative point of view instead of a quantitative point of view. You basically take, take pictures of everything you eat. It all gets tracked. You're looking at a satiety score. You're looking at protein. That There are two things that the app is trying to encourage you to do. Number one, eat enough protein. And number two, keep the satiety score in a good range. So that's basically lower energy density carbs and fats. So if you're eating lots of protein and then you know fruits and vegetables, you're going to do great. If you're just eating cookies, uh, you're going to do horrible and uh, it's just a, I think it's especially helpful for somebody who just doesn't know all this stuff. Like, you know, you and I, we walk into the grocery store and just glance at a food and the nutrition label and boom, it's like the matrix. We can see exactly what all the macros are and exactly what it's going to do long term and exactly what the satiety per calorie is. It's almost intuitive at this point, but that's a skill that you have to learn. And most people just have no idea. And so this app just takes all this complex nutritional information and just makes it super simple and dials it down to like one number. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. And, you know, people can check it out and see what they think. But yeah, it's been great working with Dr. Einfeld. He's awesome. And uh, his whole team is very awesome. tall, super tall. Holy cow. That guy's tall. He's what, six, seven or something. And I'm 5'10", but I feel so short um, every time I meet Dr. Einfeld. He's just really tall. Well, Dr. Ted Naiman, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. If you guys don't follow Ted, you definitely should. I will link to all of his stuff. His Twitter is wonderful. And his website, his Instagram, you name it. I'm going to put it here. Again, thank you so much for your time. And I am counting you in on the muscle-centric medicine board. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you.